Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's DMN download call with Professor Lou Mazur. I am Kimmy, and I'm the Rewards Event Coordinator at the Dallas Morning News. I wanted to thank you all so much for joining us for today's call. We are happy to have you all. Please remember that we will have a live Q&A towards the end of the call. And Lou, you're welcome to take it from here. Well, thank you, Kimmy, and thank you for having me back. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you all today. And uh, I, I hope this finds you all safe and well. Um, our, our topic for today uh, certainly resonates. Uh, it's the topic of political partisanship. And, and all of us in some way, of course, know and pay attention to the ongoing debates over, over many years now about political partisanship. But what I want to do today is take you back to the origins of that. And of course, there's a great irony here. The founding fathers dreaded political parties. They feared political parties more than anything else. Jefferson once said, if I cannot go to heaven but with party, I would not go there at all. They, they dreaded the idea of faction. And they thought ultimately that political parties would destroy the republic. And yet, of course, uh, they were the ones who brought in our first political party system. So what I'd like to do is sort of review for you this, this fundamental rivalry between two of the great founding brothers, Alexander Hamilton uh, and Thomas Jefferson, both of whom uh, would wage battle against each other that would lead to the shape of, of the new uh, American Republic and would lead to the formation of the first political party system. So in terms of getting started, I think we should introduce uh, both of these founding fathers. Uh, of course, Hamilton uh, has not wanted for attention uh, in the last few years. Uh, I, I trust many of you uh, have seen the musical Hamilton, which is absolutely brilliant and uh, provides an interpretation of this rivalry. Uh, but today I want to sort of stick as much as possible to, to the straight history of it. Hamilton, of course, uh, is born in 1755 uh, in the British West Indies in Nevis and St. Croix. Uh, and he's got a tough life. Uh, he's born out of wedlock, so he is a bastard child. And his mother dies when he's 14 years old, thereby making him uh, an orphan, a, 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 a very difficult double uh, of being a bastard and an orphan in the, in the 18th century world. Uh, what is it that saves him to a certain extent? Uh, I believe it's education. What we know is that uh, he was an autodidact. There was, there was an inventory of 35 books in the family history. And essentially what Hamilton did was he, he read his way toward upward mobility. This for me is one of the great themes in American history, uh, education. Uh, Lincoln, who I had an opportunity to speak to you about a month or so ago, of course is one of the great examples of someone for whom education became the path by which he could rise, by which he could emerge himself. And he never stopped valuing its importance. Well, the same with, with Hamilton. And that education literally helped get him off the island. Uh, there was a hurricane that hit, and he wrote a letter that was published in one of the local newspapers, a Royal Danish American Gazette. And a bunch of merchants were so struck by this letter and how smart and sophisticated it was they wondered who did it. When they found out it was Alexander Hamilton, they decided that what they would do is take up a collection and send him to the colonies in America where he could get the best education that was possible. Uh, this is how Hamilton arrives. He arrives, that striving immigrant who Lin-Manuel Miranda makes the, the central focus, of course, of his play, uh, the striving, ambitious immigrant this is remarkable. Uh, scholars only recently discovered Hamilton's earliest extant letter. Uh, it was published in 1769 when he was 14 years old. And he said, quote, my ambition is prevalent. I wish there was a war. Striking. And we understand where that's coming from, the fantasies of heroism and of glory. Well, it would certainly soon enough uh, get his war. So he arrives. Uh, he races down to New Jersey. This is a story I love to tell. Uh, he's a kid in a hurry. He shows up at, at the College of New Jersey, assumed to be Princeton University. He has an interview with the president. He says to the president how he would like to enroll, but he'd like to do an accelerated plan of study. Uh, he'd like some of the things that he'd always learned to count. And the president, Witherspoon, said to him, gee, I wish I could help you out. 
Uh, you seem like a bright, young, energetic guy, but we just had somebody who did an accelerated plan of study, and he's graduated, he's very nervous, he's sickly, he's hypochondriacal. His name is James Madison. Uh, that's an absolutely true story, and, and Madison uh, was indeed at Princeton. Uh, so uh, Hamilton essentially gets rejected from Princeton, and he goes to New York. He enrolls at King's College after the revolution to become Columbia uh, University. And so much of life is right place, right time. And here we have Alexander Hamilton in pre-revolutionary New York in the ferment of ideas, of things taking place uh, in 1770, uh, 1772. So let's, let's leave him there and turn to Thomas Jefferson, his great rival. Uh, Jefferson is 12 years older. Uh, and you can't have a greater comparison. Uh, if, if Hamilton is born essentially in poverty, Jefferson is born to the plantation. His father, Peter Jefferson, uh, was a surveyor. They owned a lot of land. They owned slaves. Uh, while they weren't the most elite members of Virginia society, they were certainly members of the gentry class. And Jefferson uh, attends William and Mary. Uh, he starts a legal practice. He's elected to the House of Burgesses. Uh, in, in every way, his, his path is sort of being set for him. And if we know nothing else about Jefferson, it's that he is the consummate Enlightenment figure. Don't forget, this is the great era of the Enlightenment, of reason, of the belief that the mind can, uh, can address and solve all the problems of society, that people were born blank slates, as John Locke put it in his essay on human understanding, that environmentalism mattered. And for Jefferson, there's nothing that didn't interest him. He just studied everything, learned everything, whether it was history, archaeology, anthropology, botany, horticulture, winemaking, building, music. One can go on and on and on. This is the, the ultimate life of the mind, of the intellect, experimenting, inventing, studying. His library, his personal library, becomes the basis for the Library of Congress. Uh, one of the great tributes paid to Jefferson was paid by uh, President John F. Kennedy, who in 1962 had all the winners of the Nobel Prize in the Western Hemisphere to the White House for a luncheon. And when he gave a toast, he stood up and he said, there is more genius assembled in this room today except when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. That's Jefferson, the, the Enlightenment figure who was the genius of his age. Jefferson was an ideologue. He believed in ideas. He believed in, 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 in the life of the mind. Uh, here's one of the distinctions to make between Jefferson and Hamilton. Jefferson was an idealist. Hamilton was in some ways a realist. And of course, had Jefferson done nothing else He's responsible for writing the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, including the immortal line, all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, it's a sort of drop the mic moment, if you will. Uh, John Adams, by the way, was forever uh, agitated at the fact that it was his idea that Jefferson write the first draft, but it was a committee to write the Declaration of Independence, and he was always resentful, a little bit of the other founders and the success that was accorded them. Well, the rest of the war for Jefferson doesn't go so well. Uh, he goes to Virginia where he's the wartime governor. He's not successful as the wartime governor is all. He's elected in 1779, 1780. He's fighting with the legislature. Uh, the British, of course, are, are running rampant across Virginia. George Washington, his fellow Virginian, is wondering why it is that Jefferson can't manage to get himself organized and get the state organized to resist it. He's so unhappy, he, he leaves the governorship, just goes back to one of his plantations. Uh, but uh, it is worth noting one other very important contribution of Thomas Jefferson to uh, American history and that is the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, uh, 1786. This is, this is put forward by Jefferson, and the legislature passes it. Uh, it's one of the first statutes arguing for religious freedom, freedom to express 
your conscience and your religious beliefs however you want. It's often misunderstood. Uh, it, it's freedom of religion, not necessarily freedom from religion. Jefferson himself was a deist. He read the Bible. He even reworked the Bible into what we call Jefferson's Bible. If you go to Monticello, Jefferson, who designed his own memorial stone, of course he did his own headstone. If you go, you'll see that it says, you know, here lies Thomas Jefferson, and he listed the three things for which he wanted to be remembered. And here's what he listed. He listed author of the Declaration of Independence. He listed the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. And the third, and some of you I hope are sitting there saying it to yourselves or out loud, the University of Virginia. Uh, education. He was so proud of, of being the founder, one of the founders of that. Think about that. Nothing about being Secretary of State, nothing about being Vice President, nothing about being President of the United States. And so um, Jefferson, uh, sort of, we could take him off stage for a moment. For Hamilton, just very quickly, uh, he comes to the attention of George Washington. Uh, he serves as one of Washington's aides de camp. Very, very important role. Uh, he's in part responsible for the general's correspondence, for delivering orders, for organizing. Uh, it's, it's largely an administrative role. Uh, he becomes frustrated in that role. He sort of nudges Washington for uh, the opportunity to actually uh, engage in, in, in battle. Uh, again, talk about right place, right time. He ends up in uh, Yorktown at the very culmination of the, um, of the Revolutionary War. And so that 14-year-old kid who said, my ambition is great, I wish there is a war, um, not only has his war, he comes out of it something of a hero of that war. Well, afterwards, uh, what is to be done? Uh, he's going to go back to New York. By the way, he met, courted, and married um, his, uh, his, his wife, uh, Eliza Elizabeth Schuyler, uh, in 1780, in the middle of the Revolutionary War, let's not get war, get in the way of love. Uh, and here's another way in which to succeed in America. In, in marrying Elizabeth Schuyler, uh, what he did was he married up. Uh, she's part of the uh, Schuyler family, which dates back to the Rensselaer family, big landholders in Albany, very influential politically. Uh, she, of course, uh, if you've seen the play, uh, has two sisters, and that relationship uh, becomes um, uh, becomes a very long one uh, and um, at, at times controversial. Uh, we won't get into it today, but of course, one of the things Hamilton does is, is have a public scandal in the 1790s that also helps to bring down his, his reputation. Uh, maybe we'll get into it. We'll see how much time we have. So Hamilton decides he's going to go back to New York, uh, live with his wife, uh, and practice the law. Uh, I hope some of you listening in today are indeed attorneys, and you will cringe but perhaps also smirk at his definition of what he called the law. He called it, quote, the art of fleecing my neighbors. He becomes, though, one of the preeminent attorneys. Uh, he defends loyalists against attempts to confiscate their property, uh, setting an important set of legal principles, and perhaps most important, he begins to think about the problems that this brand new American Republic faces. He starts worrying about the national debt. He starts worrying about banking. And he starts worrying about the basic inability of the new Congress under the Articles Confederation to do anything, to be able to address the needs of this republic. This requires going back and remembering that there was a revolution, of course, against the king, and a monarchical form of government was to be despised. And so partially the experiment is to figure out what kind of government would we have. Well, the initial Articles of Confederation do not have an executive branch. That's how much the reaction against the, the tyrannical absolutist tendencies of, of a king or an executive branch would be. They, they dreaded and feared it so much, there is no executive branch. The Articles of Confederation also do not give Congress the power to tax. One of the reasons for the revolution was opposition against parliamentary taxes. Uh, they, they feared this. They feared the oppressive nature of that kind of legislation. And so Congress doesn't have the power to tax. In this environment, of post-revolutionary America, economic depression, 
uh, massive speculation and inflation, Hamilton is among those leaders who recognizes that this is a problem. This is a problem that may bring down and destroy this new nation before it even gets going. What the nation needs, he and others believe, is a stronger government, a more energetic government, a government that has a certain amount of power, a government that can raise revenue. Now, again, this comes back to where I began, this fear of faction, <clears throat> this fear of allowing self-interest to reign, that if, if that is what was to take place, then it wouldn't work. But, of course, um, a number of, of uh, Americans gather, 55 of them, in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, and uh, they come away with uh, this document, the Constitution of the United States, uh, a, a, a frame of government with which, of course, we're all familiar, which at the time was incredibly experimental, innovative, even, even revolutionary, right? an attempt to, to balance these powers uh, among the three branches of government and to create a system that would work. We venerate the Constitution today, but if we go back to 1787, the ratification of the Constitution was one of the most controversial issues of the day. And it's out of the debate over the ratification of the Constitution that we get the emergence of the first political party system. Hamilton is among those who will come to be known as the Federalists. Indeed, the Federalist Papers are written by Hamilton, Madison, who at this point, of course, is seen as something of the father of the Constitution. Uh, Madison and Hamilton will also split as Madison goes with Jefferson uh, as, as opposed to that. Now, Hamilton over this question of just what kind of a government should we have, but they author the Federalist Papers, which are a series of 85 essays defined uh, in a way to address why it is that the Constitution should be ratified. To, uh, to address the concerns that people might have about them. And Hamilton is the foremost figure in, in, in penning these and in writing these. He writes 51 of the 85 essays. But the excerpt I want to read to you is, is not from Hamilton. It's from Madison, famous Federalist number 51. Uh, if later today or at some point you want to go back in and read some of these Federalist papers, which again, in recent months, uh, have, have been, uh, attention has been brought to them. I'll also read Federalist number 10, which was there addressing this issue of political faction. Well, in Madison, uh, in number 51, here's what he says. He says, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government, but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Well, clearly, uh, what they are saying here is we have to unleash self-interest, that we have to allow this to go forward. If beforehand there was a tremendous amount of anxiety about self-interest, now... It's a question of, uh, of, of har unleashing it and harnessing it, right? We know that governments um, are abusive, but they're necessary because men are not angels. And so it's in this context that the argument begins to be promulgated over defending this new constitution, a constitution that creates an executive branch, a constitution that gives Congress the power to tax, a constitution... Uh, that is um, uh, fundamentally a centralizing document that has a government that is much stronger than anything that was imagined at the time of the revolution. Well, what about Jefferson? 
how does he feel about this? Well, he's in Paris. He uh, receives a copy of the Federalist Papers. He has a correspondence with, uh, with Madison. And what he represents is the other side of the argument. Not the side of the argument of centralizing power, but the side of the argument of protecting individual freedom. Jefferson writes from Paris, I do not like the omission of a Bill of Rights providing clearly, without the aid of sophism, for freedom of religion, freedom of the press, protection against standing armies, restriction against monopolies, the eternal unremitting force of habeas corpus laws, trial by jury in all matters of fact, trial by the laws of the land and not by the law of nations. A Bill of Rights is what people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no government should refuse or rest on inferences. And there's the balance. The balance between, on the one hand, the necessity for a stronger, more centralized government that has power. On the other hand, the protection of individual liberties and rights against the encroachments that might occur on the part of the government. Those, of course, will lead to the Bill of Rights, uh, this, this, this tenuous balancing act. Uh, there's some discussion over how can we enumerate the rights. There are so many of them. And uh, Jefferson says, better half a loaf than none. Let's agree on those rights we could agree upon now and understand that those will continue to develop and change over time. It's out of the debate over ratification that we get the first political party system. The opponents of ratification call themselves the anti-federalists. Uh, and indeed, it's important to remember that the vote is very, very close. There are lots of people who are opposed to the Constitution of the United States for all the principles that, that I've just articulated. There's a tremendous amount of fear about it. Uh, Patrick Henry famously said, I smell a rat. Uh, the, the vote in Virginia is 89 to 79 to ratify. The vote in Massachusetts is 187 to 168. And so we see that while the, the document is, is just, just gets over the hump and is ratified, the opposition to it, uh, at first the anti-federalists who are then going to morph into the Democratic Republicans. And this is the first political party system. This is the preliminary system of, of, of Hamilton and Adams, the Federalists, against uh, Jefferson and Madison, the, the Democratic Republicans. Uh, we should keep in mind that word democratic. Uh, democracy is still something of an epithet. The founding fathers didn't believe in democracy the way in which we will come to uh, venerate it and believe in it. They, they, they worried about democratical despotism. They worried about too much democracy leading to anarchy. So it's a political spectrum, and they're political philosophers. They understood that one extreme, power leads to tyranny. Uh, at the other extreme, freedom leads to anarchy, and they sought to find the formula that would balance them. Well, up until this point, Hamilton and Jefferson have not met but they meet for the first time in New York in 1790 when they arrive to serve in George Washington's cabinet. Uh, Hamilton, of course, is Secretary of the Treasury. Jefferson is Secretary of State. There are two other members of the cabinet. And Jefferson would later say, each of us perhaps thought well of the other man, but it was impossible for two men to be of more opposite principles. He would tell a story a story that has obvious political purposes for when he tells it later on, but it's illustrative of attitudes towards Hamilton. He says, I had Hamilton over for dinner, and on my library wall, I had a portrait of Bacon, a portrait of Locke, and a portrait of Newton. And I turned to Hamilton, and I said, these are the three greatest men who ever lived, to which uh, Hamilton responded, no, Julius Caesar is the greatest man who ever lived. Now, again, that's circulating for political purposes. This is at a time where Hamilton seems unhinged. He seems power crazy. They wonder whether or not he's a sort of a, a second Napoleon. But it, it tells you something about the differences between them. Of course, there are many others that characterize why it is they they, they opposed each other. Uh, 
Hamilton is very much an Anglophile. He loves the English. He loves all things British. We may have had a revolution against the king, but in terms of manner and style and civility and his belief in the gentry, uh, he ordered his clothes from England. The Bank of England was his model for, for commerce. They were the greatest empire in the world. Uh, he, he loved the, the British. Jefferson is a Francophile. Uh, he's in France. He's in France at the time leading up to the French Revolution. Uh, he sees them as the inheritors and the perpetuators of, of notions of liberty and legality and fraternity, uh, revolution against the king. And the British he despises. He once said of the British, they are a group of rich, proud, swearing, hectoring, squabbling, carnivorous animals. That's a quote from Jefferson about the British. So there's that fundamental difference. There's a difference in that Hamilton I think, comes to represent the nation and understands the importance of the idea of the nation, whereas Jefferson remains wedded to the idea of the individual. Uh, and, and there are other ways, as, as I've thought about the two of them, uh, one could say that you know, Hamilton is a pessimist, but he's forward-looking. Uh, he believes essentially people only pursue their self-interest. Uh, he doesn't trust the virtue, the goodness of the people. But we can use that in a way to build and to harness. And he has a vision of a future that's a vision of development, right? economic development, commercial development. Jefferson, in many ways, is an optimist. He's the man of light. He's the man of reason. He's the man of the enlightenment. But he's backward looking. He's essentially a preservationist. Land, he believes, not labor, is the essence of independence. He hates the cities and, of course, uh, he's a slaveholder, and, and that's a subject that perhaps we will come back to or, or, or address uh, in the questions and answers. So there's a, other fundamental differences reigning there between them. Well, these political parties really begin to wage battle in Washington's administration, and they frame the direction of American society. Hamilton's genius and one of the reasons for his revival and one of the reasons why now he's getting the attention that had been lost to him is he's really seen as the architect of American finance capitalism. Uh, he understands that the foundations of government are based on revenue and interest. He argued that commerce protected liberty, liberty and he proposed plans by which to put those mechanisms into place. Uh, none were more important than his plan, plan for public credit. He wanted to fund and assume uh, the debts of the states. He thought that this would build confidence, that what one needs to do is link the interest of the creditor to the success of the debtor. Uh, he understood financial markets long before others understood financial markets. I mean, he's something of a savant when it comes to economics. I mean, he's not alone. He's reading, again, widely, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, uh, other economists who are thinking about these things. He recognizes that the, the government can become more powerful by creating new debt to pay off the old debt. And by assuming the state debts, therefore, the government would gain a hold over the tendencies of, of the states to atomize, as we well know. This is an ongoing forever issue in American history. It's one of the most important stories, right? The balance between the power of the federal government and the power of states comes up time and time again, and that's part of what's being waged here. Uh, there's tremendous opposition to Hamilton's plan. Uh, debtors, in particular, uh, don't like it. A lot of the states had already paid off their state debt from after the revolution, and the whole idea of going into debt was anathema to a generation of Americans who were raised on the principle that debt equals enslavement. John Adams himself, a Federalist, said there are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword and the other is by debt. Famously, they reach a compromise. And for whatever we might say about partisan politics, uh, in this first political party system, Federalists and Democratic Republicans understood that deals had to be struck. And here's one of the all-time deals. Uh, they meet privately, Madison, Hamilton, and Jefferson in June 1790. 
and Jefferson and Madison, who are completely opposed to this plan to fund and assume the debt of the states, uh, say, we'll go along with it if you agree to move the government, to move the government from New York to uh, the banks of the Potomac, essentially to Virginia. Uh, why did they want that? In part, it has to do with uh, ideas about government. If we're going to have a government with this kind of power, we want it close to us. We want to be able to keep our eye on it. We want to be able to monitor it. Uh, they want the government not in New York, but uh, in, in the area of Virginia. Uh, I, I'm not completely naive. We also know that Washington and Madison invested in thousands of acres of land that would become incredibly valuable once, uh, once the capital was moved there. Uh, but indeed, uh, they, they agree to this. Uh, Hamilton uh, wisely understands that uh, whatever it is he needs to do to get his plan in place, he knows that eventually Jefferson and others will find it uh, much more difficult to undo it than to do it. So this is one of the, um, one of the important innovations of, of the Federalists. Uh, the other is the bank, the Bank of the United States. I had mentioned the Bank of England. Hamilton loved the bank. He wanted to create a national bank, a bank that would expand the money supply, provide uniform currency, extend credit, collect revenue, make debt payments. He understood that you could monetize the debt by accepting securities for bank stock and then issuing notes. He thought that this would be essential to helping to transform the United States, this new country, into an economic commercial superpower. But the hostility to banks is severe. Adams, our whole banking system I ever abhorred, Southern has exposed the expansion of federal powers. Again, this is that other example, federal power versus state power. Local banks were one thing. You knew your banker. You dealt with your banker. You had an arrangement. But a national bank, uh, they concerned that it would become monopolistic, that it would be characterized by corruption speculation, stock jobbers. Uh, they argued it was unconstitutional. This is one of the, the earliest moments where we begin to see that argument being made. The Constitution has been ratified. Can you do something that the Constitution does not explicitly permit? And here again, Hamilton is, is, uh, is a political and legal mind, is a genius. He, he's one of the first to argue that there are implied powers, that Congress has the power to create anything that is necessary and proper, that there's the general welfare clause and the commerce clause. And so this battle becomes joined. It's a battle between expanded governments, the Federalists, and limited government, the Democratic Republicans. Uh, George Washington is neither. Oh, George Washington is an amazing figure who, who's deserving of our of our praise and our attention. He remains sort of uh, apolitical to the best that he can. He's a Virginian, but in this case, he refuses to veto the bank bill, uh, and the bank bill is passed. There's another area in which Hamilton also wanted to help promote America, and that's in the area of manufacturing, government activism, uh, in terms of, of uh, taxes to support local industry, uh, investment in internal improvements, uh, manufacturing, all those kinds of things, labor, the understanding of labor uh, as the source of wealth, very different than the Jeffersonian vision of land uh, and farming as the source of wealth. Well, the two of them are literally pitted against each other. One, Jefferson said, like two fighting cocks in, in Washington's cabinet. And um, I'd like to take a minute to share with you an exchange of letters. Uh, I just love the documents of American history, and there's this moment where both of them write lengthy letters to George Washington complaining about one another or, and letters to others. Uh, if you have a chance later today, um, just so you can see just how long this letter is, Google Thomas Jefferson's letter to George Washington, September 9th, 1792. It goes on for page after page after page, complaining bitterly about his political rival, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I'll just give you a taste of what he says. He says to President Washington, 
that I have utterly in my private conversations disapproved of the system of the Secretary of the Treasury. I acknowledge and I avow this was not merely a speculative difference. His system flowed from principles adverse to liberty. Keep that in mind. And was calculated to undermine and demolish the republic by creating an influence of his department over the members of the legislature. Uh, and then if you look at this letter, several pages later, he will turn a little bit more uh, nasty. And he says, I will not suffer my retirement to be clouded by the slanders of a man whose history, from the moment at which history could stoop to notice him, is a tissue of machinations against the liberty of the country, which is not only received and given him bread, but heaped honors on his head. Oh, my goodness. Well, if you know anything, you know Hamilton, who wrote all those essays, is not about to keep quiet. He writes a lengthy set of essays, one of which he says that Mr. Jefferson is at the head of a faction hostile to me and actuated by views in my judgment subversive of the principles of good government and dangerous to the union, peace, and happiness of the country. And that's it in a nutshell, the differences between them. Hamilton accuses Jefferson of being subversive of government. Jefferson accuses Hamilton of being subversive of liberty. The great battle of the late 18th century is where do you draw the line between government and between liberty? Well, Jefferson gets fed up. He um, resigns as Secretary of State. Uh, we get to an election, of course, the election of 1796. And here's what Hamilton says. He says, all personal and partial consideration must be discarded and everything must give way to the great object of excluding Jefferson. He despises him. He'll do anything to make sure he's not elected president. And here's where Hamilton tends to go off the rails a little bit. It's also one of the reasons why he's been lost to us to, to history. Uh, he not only opposes Jefferson, he also opposes John Adams, the presumptive nominee of his party. Adams, who had been vice president, Adams, who was a Federalist. Uh, Hamilton doesn't like Adams any more than anyone else. Not only does he not like him, he actually has the nerve to publish a pamphlet denouncing Adams. Uh, in that pamphlet, he says about Adams, he has vanity without bounds, distempered jealousy, extreme egotism, ungovernable temper. I mean, in effect, he's committing political suicide because clearly he hates the Democratic Republicans, but he's also losing whatever support he might have within, uh, within his own Federalist Party. Uh, to make matters worse, uh, he's involved in a scandal. I alluded to this earlier, uh, a scandal in which uh, he has an extramarital affair, uh, and he pays hush money, and the hush money gets investigated uh, by, by James Monroe, uh, and, and again, he publishes a pamphlet in which he defends himself against the allegations of corruption. I mean, it's a long story, but it's, it, it's an amazing story, and it's an important story to tell for people who perhaps idealize or romanticize the 18th century. So he's essentially being accused of using his position as Secretary of the Treasury to pay money to the husband of the woman he had an affair with to keep matters quiet. And when he publishes this pamphlet, he admits to, quote, an amorous connection with his wife, but says, I was not corrupt and I did not use Treasury funds. Of course, his political opponents can't get over this. This is the late 18th century. I mean, an extramarital affair in the, in the 21st century is scandalous. Imagine the 18th century where you have this person, uh, this political figure admitting it. His political opponents can't get over it. They, they, one of them says, let me get this straight. His defense is I'm a rake, therefore I cannot be a swindler. And increasingly there's, there's opposition mounting to, to Hamilton. Uh, by the summer of 1798, uh, John Adams calls him the bastard brat of a Scottish peddler. He says the man is stark mad. 
He's as great a hypocrite as any in the United States. He has the devil in his eyes. He's the evil genius of the country. And so we begin to see the unraveling a bit of Hamilton personally, but we also have, in many ways, the, um, the spread of this political animosity, this political violence into the larger political system as a whole. For the first time, we have political newspapers that are partisan polemical newspapers, the National Gazette and the Gazette of the United States. They each only support the political principles of their own party. They each cast aspersion and gossip uh, about each other. The first reports uh, that Jefferson had had sexual relations with one of his slaves appears in one of these newspapers. Uh, this becomes the sort of beginning of the kind of polarization and partisanship. There's even literally a fight on the floor uh, of, of Congress. Uh, if you want later, there's a great contemporary print of this that shows these, these two representatives battling. Uh, Roger Griswold, the Federalist from uh, Connecticut, uh, goes after spitting Matt Lyon. He, he, he earns that sobriquet by uh, actually spitting tobacco juice into the face of his political opponent. Uh, one goes after him with a cane, another goes after him with fire tongues, that, that the stakes have been risen very, very high. And the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans are entrenched in political warfare behind which are two very different visions of the future of America. Hamilton, of course, uh, also gets caught up in his uh, political contretemps with Aaron Burr. Uh, it's a complicated story. Uh, Burr changed political parties. That's part of it. I and mean, when he changed political parties, uh, he actually defeated Hamilton's father-in-law for office. Uh, they, in some ways, were very much alike. Uh, they were both orphans and soldiers and lawyers. They started families at the same time. For a while, they worked with one another. But uh, indeed, that would all come to a uh, to to a bitter uh, and and terrifying end um, at the duel in in 1804, where Hamilton uh, simply cannot find it in his in himself to disavow comments that he had made about Burr. Again, this is another example of the kind of political nastiness and vituperation that spread. Burr had read that Hamilton said some despicable things about him. And all Hamilton had to do was say that, uh, that he hadn't, that it was uh, misinterpreted, that uh, it was misreported. Uh, he refuses to do so, of course, and uh, infamously uh, on July 11, 1804, um, he, he dies in his duel with Burr. Four years before that, we have the election of 1800. And this is one of the most pivotal moments uh, in, in American history because it represents, for the first time, the peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another. Uh, no one knew if that was possible. No one knew if that could take place. Uh, the election of 1800 is known as a revolution, a revolution of 1800. Uh, as real a revolution, said Jefferson, in the principles of our government as that of 1776 was in its form, not affected by sword, but by suffrage. Uh, Jefferson had hated Adams' administration, even though he was vice president during it. He, he called it a reign of witches. It was under Adams' administration that we have passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, legislation targeting political opponents uh, and and. and being willing to jail them, uh, being willing to exile them for, um, for opinions expressed in some cases. Uh, there's tremendous fear of what would happen, and it turns out that the election comes down to Jefferson versus Burr. Poor Hamilton. I mean, he hates both of them at this point. Uh, he thinks that it's political suicide for the nation if, if either one is elected uh, it goes uh, to the states because each is tied with 73 electoral votes. Uh, 16 states uh, vote, nine votes are needed. 
35 ballots take place. The vote remains eight to six. Imagine, I mean, Burr could have been elected president. Uh, Hamilton, in an act of statesmanship, even though he despised Jefferson, understood that Jefferson would be the better candidate. He wrote to support uh, some of the electors changing their votes. Uh, and indeed, ultimately, uh, Jefferson is elected. Uh, famously, he tries to bridge that partisan divide that had so split the nation open in the 1790s. In his inaugural address, he says, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. But uh, he would continue to, uh, as president, of course, do those things that fit with his vision of the future of America, none more important than the Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana Purchase doubles the size of the United States. And it fits with this phrase of his, he talked in terms of an empire of liberty, an empire of liberty, that if faction could only be contained by spreading and extending the nation, then doubling the size of the United States was the way in which to do that. The, the phrase in Federalist Number 10 is extend the sphere. Extend the sphere, and you create a safety valve, a safety valve that can siphon off the kind of opposition that otherwise could lead to, to, to revolution or, or worse. Um, there's an irony that I think all of you will appreciate. Uh, Jefferson, the, the state's rightist, the one who is most fearful of executive overreach, uh, in purchasing Louisiana, probably acted unconstitutionally as president uh, to, to take the act for which he wasn't authorized. But uh, it becomes fundamental to this other vision of America. Let, let, let me put it another way, perhaps an even more abstract way, and yet a way that I think can be very useful. The Federalists believe in expansion across time. The Democratic Republicans believed in growth across space, time versus space, time, capitalism, investment, industry, uh, building, internal improvements, all of those measures, banking, that were part of the Fellows Program, space, land, farming, independence, uh, the growth of the nation westward. These characterize, in many ways, uh, one of the fundamental differences between them. Uh, the Federalists would collapse as a political party after the War of 1812. They would give rise to the Whig Party, W-H-I-G, coming out of Whig Commonwealth ideology in 18th century England. Uh, the Whig Party itself would collapse uh, in 1854 and give rise to the Republican Party. So there's a straight line from the Federalists to the Whigs to the Republicans. Uh, the Democratic Republicans under Andrew Jackson would become the Democrats, uh, the Democratic Party, and we have had since 1854 uh, Republicans versus Democrats, except in many ways the political principles for which they stand uh, have inverted uh, and changed uh, over time. So the party name doesn't necessarily represent anymore what the party uh, once, once believed in. I, I want to draw to a conclusion and then, and then take your questions and answers uh, by leaving you with, with Adams and Jefferson in retirement. Now, Adams and Jefferson hated each other as much as Hamilton and Jefferson hated each other. You have to keep that in mind. Remember, Jefferson thought Adams' presidency was a reign of witches. Uh, he, he, he despaired over, over, over Adams' actions. Uh, and Adams, too, wanted nothing to do with Jefferson. In fact, Adams, who was the first occupant of the newly built White House, left Washington without staying for Jefferson's inauguration. And so these two, who together had led the revolution, the Declaration of Independence, served in the Continental Congress, uh, had served in a variety of capacities, who had been friends, Abigail Adams and Thomas Jefferson, and their families had been united, uh, they, they no longer speak to each other, except starting in around 1812, 1813, they're reunited in an epistolary correspondence, letters to each other that will carry forward until the day they die. And it's one of the great correspondences in American history. And again, if you're looking for something to read in these days, 
uh, it's published, the correspondence of Adams and Jefferson. Think about these two titans sitting in retirement, thinking about life, thinking about the history, thinking about the future. Uh, Adams says to Jefferson, whether you or I were right, posterity must judge. Well, that's us, I guess. Jefferson says, one of the questions on which our parties took different sides was on the improvability of the human mind. They knew that the generation which commences a revolution, quote, can rarely complete it. One of the answers, by the way, to the unasked question of why was Hamilton lost to us for so long is because these guys wrote him out of the history. Remember, they both live until 1826. Indeed, they both die on July 4th, 1826, as most of you, I hope, know, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, for anyone who wants any greater evidence of the providential nature of this country, uh, that fact alone can provide it. And they had all this time to think about the history of the past, to write the history of the past. And what was that history? It was George Washington, Ben Franklin, James Madison, it was Adams, it was Jefferson, not Hamilton, who both of them despised. But they also they didn't want to dwell on the past. Jefferson says at one point, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. And this stunning, stunning, stunning sentence from Jefferson to Adams. Crippled wrists and fingers make writing slow and laborious. But while writing to you, I lose the sense of these things and the recollection of ancient times when youth and health made happiness out of everything. I forget for a while the hoary winter of our age when we can think of nothing but how to keep ourselves warm. Well, I think it's a good note for us to end on, that despite the political partisanship, despite the bitterness, the fighting, that these two great revolutionary founding fathers could come together, can reconquer their friendship, can together figure out what the future of the nation might be. And I can only hope that, um, that, that this uh, discussion of, of the political rivalries of the 1790s um, can also give us some comfort that there's been extreme partisanship in the past. Uh, there may be extreme partisanship in the present, but one of the great things about this nation is its ability to get through those moments and, in fact, build a better country ahead. Thank you all so very much for attending today uh, and for, for listening to this talk. I look forward uh, very much to hearing your questions. Uh, before we go there, I just want to invite you uh, to please feel free to get in touch with me afterwards. Uh, you'll find I will respond very quickly if you email me. Uh, my information is all available on my website. It, it's um, lewismajor.com, www.lewismajor.com. Uh, feel free to email me at lewis.major at rutgers.edu or through my website. Uh, and I'd also very much like to um, advertise, if you will, my forthcoming book, which uh, is a one-volume history of the United States in which I try uh, in a concise fashion to sort of tell the story because one of the things that so uh, sort of stresses me is, is the sort of lack of historical knowledge in America. And this was my attempt to write a book that, that sort of provides an, an easy place for people to go to learn the history. It's called The Sum of Our Dreams, A Concise History of America. Uh, and I look forward to your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, we really appreciate all your insights on Hamilton and Jefferson, and I know our readers really appreciate what you have to say. For those of you who have a question, please follow the Q&A instructions. I believe it will start by saying press star six. In the meantime, Lou, um, I sent out a questionnaire last night asking if people had a question ahead of time. So while we wait for um, questions in the queue, I wanted to ask you um, something that our read a reader asked. Um, the first question being, how true to actual events is the popular musical Hamilton? It's, it's a great question. Um, it's based, of course, on Ron Chernow's wonderful book, uh, Hamilton. Uh, so it's, it's, it's true in the sense that many, many of the facts, of course, are correct, but we, we have to sometimes distinguish right between facts and interpretation. You have to keep in mind it's a, it's a work of art, not a work of history. 
it, it dramatizes uh, in brilliant ways this rivalry and this story. Uh, there are things in it that historians, of course, would question. Uh, the nature of Hamilton's relationship with his sister or Angelica, for example, or, or just how much of, of an anti-slavery person Hamilton was. Um, what I love, of course, about it is anything that gets people asking questions about American history um, is, is, is fantastic, uh, and it provides opportunities for people to go back in. Uh, this has been true for a very long time. You know, I think back to when Ken Burns' documentary on the Civil War first appeared around 1989. Again, this was a moment that transformed the ways in which people thought about history and got interested in history. Uh, but um, as, as with any art form, I think we have to distinguish uh, between the sort of facts uh, and the interpretation of those facts. And the play offers uh, an interpretation. It's a very pro-Hamilton sort of play. Uh, one could conceivably write it from a Jeffersonian point of view. Uh, that, that would be somewhat different. But I, I hope all of you have seen it and, or, or get a chance to. Yeah, going off of that, um, I know Disney Plus announced today that they are going to release the Hamilton filming um, on July 3rd, right before uh, July 4th, actually. So if you guys have Disney Plus, definitely check that out whenever it, um, uh, whenever it premieres um, on July 3rd. Um, again, if you have a question, please press star six to get yourself in the queue. Um, Lou, another question that that reader had, she said she wanted to know, um, please elaborate on the irony of Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the phrase, all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence, and at the same time, owned slaves. It may be the single deepest question of American history, right? Dealing with the paradox of slavery and freedom. And I don't have an easy answer. I've spent my career, and many Americans have, trying to come to terms with it. Uh, we have to understand it in 18th century terms. Uh, while there were abolitionists, uh, that's an incredibly radical movement at the time. Uh, among the founding fathers, uh, Washington did free his slaves in his will. He didn't have control over his wife's slaves, the Custis slaves. Uh, but at the same time, he never questioned slavery. He saw it as a necessity. And we have to think back to the ways in which they viewed the world and the ways in which they viewed uh, enslaved persons, uh, the degree to which they thought they were capable of freedom. Uh, Jefferson struggled with this. He struggled with it philosophically. Uh, he said uh, after the Missouri Compromise, I tremble for my country when I fear that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. He knew slavery in one way or another might be uh, what brings down the, uh, the nation. And, and, and certainly it wasn't hard in 1820 to foresee a civil war. At the same time, personally, uh, he got deeply into debt. Uh, he could never figure out, even if he wanted to, how to extricate himself from this system of labor upon which he was dependent. And to complicate matters further, of course, uh, he has a relationship with Sally Hemings uh, in which he fathered children. Uh, this is no longer controversial. The Thomas Jefferson Foundation itself acknowledges the evidence for this. The only slaves he does emancipate uh, were those he fathered with Sally Hemings. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's troubling. Uh, it's disturbing. It's, it's one of the great dilemmas at the heart of the meaning of America. Uh, but having written that line, he gave to Lincoln, for example, uh, the ammunition he needed to argue that what that line meant was the ways in which we think about it today, perhaps not necessarily the ways in which uh, Jefferson was willing to apply it. But thank you. It's, 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 it's a tremendous question, one worth um, dwelling on. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, as of right now, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the Q and A um, queue. Um, however, okay. I will include I will include your email as well as your website in a follow up email with all of our attendees and guests. Um, so right now, we can wrap things up and conclude. Um, thank you all for joining in on today's call with Professor Lou Major, and we are so thankful for each and every one of you. And for those of you who called in early and heard our Alexa briefing, um, we will be sending out information in our follow-up email as well on how to listen to those every morning um, just to get your day started with the latest news stories. For future DMN download calls and other important information, please continue to check out our weekly rewards newsletters on Tuesdays. To stay up to date on new developments with the coronavirus, please sign up for the coronavirus newsletter. 
Again, we wanted to thank you all for joining us for today's call. If you aren't a member of the Dallas Morning News, we are glad that you were able to jump on today's call with us, and we hope that you will continue to support local journalism by subscribing today. Lou, do you have any closing thoughts for our readers? Uh, just thank you again for having me, and please stay safe and well through these times. And I, I look forward perhaps uh, one day in the not-too-distant future of being invited back to Dallas where I've had some great opportunities to speak live to, uh, to Dallas Morning News audiences, and I, I just can't wait for that to, uh, to take place again. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, again, everyone, I am Kimmy, the Rewards Event Coordinator for the Dallas Morning News. If you have any questions for us, please let us know. Um, I'm signing off as well. Stay safe and stay well. I'll talk soon. Thanks so much, Lou. Thank you.